This is Principles of Epidemiology and the topic that I will be going through with you is investigating epidemics. I'm Dwight Baker. The objectives that will be covered throughout the course of this presentation, by the end of this lesson you will be able to define the term epizootic and zootic and exotic. Describe the different types of epidemics, discuss the aims associated with investigating an epidemic, outline the steps involved in investigating an epidemic, analyze steps taken to investigate epidemic including alternative strategies, and develop hypotheses for investigating an epidemic. Disease occurrence in community can be classified as expected levels or excess levels. Endemic, which is the expected level, is a habitual presence of a disease within a given population or geographic area, may also be referred to as the usual prevalence of that given disease within such, uh, such an area. Example, malaria in Belize. Endemic diseases with epidemic potential, malaria, cholera, measles, hepatitis, meningococcal, meningitis. Epidemic, on the other hand, is the occurrence of disease in excess in a community or region. An e epidemic can be for a few hours, such as food poisoning, or weeks, such as influenza or dengue, or years, in the case of the bubonic plaque or Black Death, which occurred from 1347 to 1352, which was responsible for 25 million persons dying in Europe. Pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. Example, H1N1 influenza or HIV AIDS. A major difference between epidemic and pandemic is that epidemics are concentrated usually in one region and pandemic affects a more widespread cross-section of persons in the population. Other terms used in describing levels of diseases in a community are sporadic, irregular, occurrence of diseases, which may be an epidemic, and outbreak, often used interchangeably with epidemic, is also considered an epidemic, but of shorter duration. Understanding epizootic and zootic and exotic or exotic diseases is crucial in understanding the interaction between humans and animals and the transfer of diseases between the two populations. Epizootic diseases are essential to monitor as they can lead to significant economic losses in agriculture, affected food supplies, and sometimes directly impact human health. For instance, anthrax, an epizootic disease, can affect both animals and humans. Bird flu transmitted between birds can be passed to humans, uh, such as the avian influenza, or swine flu, uh, such as the H1N1 influenza virus, which occur among pigs, can be transferred to humans. By controlling epizootics in animals, the risk of transmission to humans can be minimized, safeguarding public health. Enzootic diseases, on the other hand, are prevalent in specific animal populations. While these diseases may not directly affect humans, they can act as reservoirs, leading to zoonotic infections. Diseases like brucellosis, Lyme diseases, and leptospirosis fall into this category. Understanding enzootic diseases helps in preventing potential spillover events and implementing preventative measures. Exotic diseases imported from other regions emphasize the global interconnectedness of disease spread. These diseases can impact both animals and human communities alike. By identifying and controlling exotic diseases, nations can prevent the introduction and dissemination of novel pathogens, reducing the risk of new diseases emerging in both animals and human populations. These categories of diseases in animals are integral to our understanding of public health as a whole and the impact of human-animal interaction in disease outbreaks. 
we can anticipate potential disease outbreaks, implement effective preventative strategies, and minimize the impact on both animals and human population, thus of course reducing the disease burden and promoting overall public health. Epidemics can be classified based on their spread, common source, propagated, seasonal, cyclic, and non-communicable. Common source epidemics, or single point source, in these epidemics, the primary source of infection or toxin of the disease producing agent affecting all persons is from one common entity. There are three main types of common source epidemics. First, we'll look at point source or single exposure epidemic. In this type of epidemic, the disease agent accountable for transmission of disease is exposed to susceptible population at one point in time and only once. Staphylococcus aureus, food intoxication due to ingestion of contaminated food, is a very good example of this type of epidemic. This may result in a sudden rise of cases which decline correspondingly fast. The next step we'll look at is continuous or multiple exposure epidemic. There is a prolonged continuous exposure to the source of infection and uh, such epidemics will not cease to exist unless the source is removed and all susceptible persons have developed immuni immunity to the disease causing agent. Contaminated water becomes a regular source of infection to the people using it and the epidemic may continue until the water is treated and made safe. Example, the color epidemic with John Snow in London. Now, similarly, a doctor who is a disease carrier may keep on infecting patients in his practice until treated and made non-infectious. And our third subtype here, intermittent source. In this case of epidemic, the source is uncertain. It could be a common source which produces regular peaks if uh, plotted on a graph or a continuous source and the cases are irregular. Another major type we could look at as well, propagated epidemics. A propagated epidemic is generally ongoing transmission of infectious origin and results from person-to-person -person transmission of disease agents. The secondary cases are the source of infection for new cases. When plotted on a graph, there is a steady rise and tapers over a period of time. Transmission may be vehicle-borne or vector-borne and continues over a few generations until there are no susceptible individuals. Such epidemics are more likely where crowds of susceptible individuals gather as in fairgrounds and fiestas. Another type are your seasonal epidemics. As the name suggests, they occur during particular seasons. Diseases such as diarrhea, dengue fever, are more communal during summer periods and rainy seasons, influenza, exacerbation of asthma and pneumonia will occur more readily during the winter season. There's also cyclical epidemics. Some epidemics tend to occur in cycles which may repeat over a period of time, which may be days, period could be weeks, months or years. An example of this type of epidemic is measles virus, which tends to occur in cycles of two to three years. Hepatitis A, a Native American city with hepatitis A virus, occurs every five to seven years. And another major type we'll look at as well are epidemics of non-communicable diseases. The history of epidemics showed greater focus on infectious diseases. However, sedentary lifestyles and minimal physical activity due to advances in science and technology, the change in lifestyle have led to living patterns, which has seen an increase in non-communicable diseases, etching a percentage of epidemic reports 
with its marketed rise in chronic metabolic diseases like hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and mental diseases. So when you look in terms of the aims of epidemiology, we want to determine the geographic spread and magnitude of the epidemic, helping authorities allocate resources effectively and target interventions where they are most needed. Identify and implement control measures swiftly to curtail transmission and minimize the overall number of cases, thereby reducing the impact on public health. You want to pinpoint the origin of the epidemic, facilitating the removal or effective management of the source, preventing future outbreaks and ensuring long-term public safety. You also want to evaluate the effectiveness of treatment and preventative strategies employed and of course, inform healthcare decision and contribute to evidence-based practices for future epidemic. You want to also enhance the skills and knowledge of healthcare professionals, ensuring a competent workforce capable of responding efficiently to epidemics, implementing proper protocols and providing quality of care to the affected population. And of course, you want to maintain transparent communication with the public, dispelling any misinformation and educating the community about the epidemic, promoting awareness, understanding, and cooperation, which are vital in epidemic management. So the purpose for which you want to, of course, investigate the epidemic is to identify the etiologic agent, identify the source of the etiologic agent, and identify the most appropriate control measure for the epidemic. How is this done? You first start a preliminary investigation. You want to identify and notify your cases, collect and analyze the data, manage and control the disease, and of course, disseminate the findings and follow-ups. Now, there are 10 steps to investigating an epidemic. Now, as the expert or the epidemiologist, you might not necessarily follow these steps in chronological order, depending on what that epidemic is or the nature of the disease that has been spread among the population. A decision can be made to either do these activities concurrently, or you may of course, look at how you control before you start that investigation process. Now, in terms of to confirm that there is really an epidemic, this is done by comparing the incidence with the usual cases or endemic figures for the specific population, place and time. Searching for unreported cases, such as in the iceberg phenomenon, what we see may not be all persons affected. You also want to review literature of the condition to ensure that it is really an epidemic, and if not, to reassure the public to make preparations for the rest of the investigation. In verifying the diagnosis, a case definition is established, and this is done in order to classify individuals as being positive or negative. Lab tests are carried out to confirm diagnosis, maybe autopsies. Efforts must be made to ensure that the lab tests are reliable. It might be necessary to repeat the test and retain the services of a specialist. The purposes of the diagnosis forms a basis for further investigation. Once a population at risk is defined, a medical examination can be conducted of all persons to assist in the decision on treatment and follow-up, and some may have to be hospitalized depending on the progression of the disease. So in conducting your epidemiological investigations, there are some things that you want to consider. So now we start looking at descriptive epidemiology and what that means exactly. 
you start formulating hypotheses. You test that hypothesis, collect and analyze data, and of course you are going to be arriving at a conclusion based on the data that you, of course, analyzed. There are certain things that you want to also keep a focus on. You look at, say, the time of onset of the specific disease. You can look at things such as signs and symptoms, lifestyle habits, or other relevant information that may be of interest to the epidemic that you are investigating. There are things that you could also look at, such as environmental factors, and here you could consider things such as water supply. You could also look at the travel history for those persons who are impacted. The data will allow the investigator to describe the epidemic in terms of people, place, and time. Investigators, of course, analyze epidemics by considering key variables, people, demographics of the affected individuals, place, geographic location of cases, and time, patterns of occurrence over a specific period. By examining these variables, epidemiologists can identify trends and patterns and potential risk factors associated with the epidemics. John Snow, a pioneer in epidemiology, constructed the epidemic curve by plotting the number of cases on the y-axis against time on, of course, your x-axis. This graphical representation allowed him to visualize the outbreak progression, enabling the identification of clusters and patterns crucial for understanding the epidemic dynamics and implementing targeted intervention. The epidemic curve provides valuable insight into the epidemic source and transmission patterns. Of course, sharp peaks might indicate a common exposure, helping investigators focus on specific places or events. And studies, of course, analyzing the curve generate hypotheses about potential causes, guiding further research, preventative measures, and public health interventions aimed at controlling and mitigating the epidemic. So we'll look at some visual information here that of course helps us in formulating our hypothesis. And the classic example that we will look at is the spot map or the spot map snow. Now the spot map is a visualization technique famously employed by John Snow during 1854 with that Broad Street cholera outbreak in London. Snow used a spot map to mark the locations of cholera cases on a map of the area. Each case was represented by a spot allowing him to identify a cluster of cases centered around a specific water pump on Broad Street. By plotting the cases on the map, Snow of course visually demonstrated the geographic concentration of the outbreak eventually leading him to the conclusions that the contaminated water from the Broad Street pump was the source of the cholera epidemic. This method was instrumental in understanding, of course, that spatial distribution of cases and played a pivotal role in pinpointing the case of outbreak, illustrating the power of spatial analysis in epidemiology. There are some other methodologies that can be used, of course, to help characterize and visualize the epidemic. So you can start hypothesizing. These include a geographic information system. GIS technology allows epidemiologists to map and analyze the spatial distribution of cases in a digital format, providing a more comprehensive understanding of the spatial pattern in terms of the occurrence of the epidemic. A dedicated spatial analysis software can also provide advanced statistical method for detecting clusters and spatial patterns. Here, you'll be able to identify statistical significant clusters of cases and potential sources of outbreak. In genomic epidemiology, you also compare the genomes of pathogens from different cases 
Researchers can, of course, trace the transmission route and identify the source of the outbreak. This is mostly useful when you have things such as a bacterial outbreak. Mobile data and GPS tracking in the era, of course, of smartphones, mobile data and GPS tracking can provide valuable information about individual movements. This aids in understanding potential exposure or help with things such as contact tracing. When you look in terms of other methods, you have things such as social network analysis, which is becoming more and more useful. There is also remote sensing and, of course, epidemiological questionnaires and interviews. These methods are not just standalone. Sometimes there can also be an integration of the various methodologies to aid in formulating your hypothesis. Now, let's create a story on which we will structure our hypothesis. So a sudden onset of symptoms of food poisoning and the clustering of cases around the Jamboree community restaurant, resulting in 32 cases of food poisoning. This occurred in March 2023. Now, suggesting a common source of contamination here would be the Jamboree restaurant. Our investigation will focus on identifying the cases or the specific food item or ingredient, potential cross-contamination points, and lapses in food handling practices within the Jamboree restaurant or premises during that mentioned period. Additionally, exploring hygiene practices of the restaurant staff and supply chain of ingredients can provide crucial insight into the origin of the food pathogens responsible for the outbreak. Now, in developing our hypothesis, we could write, say, the recent outbreak of food poisoning among 32 patrons who consumed food from the Jamboree restaurant in St. Andrew in March 2023, maybe due to a foodborne pathogen contaminating a specific dish or ingredient served during that time period. And you have that hypothesis displayed here. Now, note the hypothesis should address most likely source of exposure to the agent. And in this case, that source would be the restaurant. It should also address the mode of transmission. And in this case, we're looking at foodborne. So the mode here would be vehicle transmission and explore possible future control measures. The investigator should also take into account the disease process and the population at risk. So here, of course, you want to look at that clustering. So most of these cases, so that 32 cases that you have here, clustered around the Jamboree restaurant. Now, in terms of your discussion must be held with local health officials and community leaders. As in the case with snow with the parish fathers in London, you want to involve the community leaders in this case. They may not be technical expert, but they have a wealth of information and can provide inf insights. So it helps to forge positive relationship with the community leaders and community members, as this will also help to ensure cooperation and better outcomes. Information from lab tests and patients' interviews also contributes to the development of the hypothesis. With the advances in biomedical sciences, it would be prudent to include objective findings as well. So in terms of testing, of course you developed a hypothesis and now you are about to test that hypothesis to see whether or not it holds true. The hypothesis provides guidelines for the rest of the investigation to prove or disprove it. Here you could do say a case control study, but you must remain objective. 
So you developed an alternative hypothesis. What would be your null hypothesis? In this case, we want the statement to indicate that any observed clustering of cases is due to random ch uh, chance and that there is no specific food item or ingredient or food handling practices within the restaurant that contributed to the outbreak. So the null hypothesis in this case essentially states that there is no effect or relationship and so any observed pattern or clustering of food poisoning cases are purely co coincidental and do not result from any specific factor related to the Jamboree restaurant or the food served by the Jamboree restaurant. Scientists often test null hypothesis against alternative hypothesis and in this case the hypothesis, hypothesis suggesting a specific foodborne pathogen or contamination source would be the Jamboree restaurant. The aim is to determine if there is enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of this alternative explanation. So you've generated a hypothesis. You've, of course, looked at your methodology and you've applied that methodology and started the data collection. And now you're ready for the analysis of the data that you have collected. Here you want to, of course, think of the statistical test that you're going to be using to determine the epidemiological significance of the findings. And of course, where possible, you want to be presenting these in standardized manner. So something that you could look at here are measures of occurrence. So you look at um, something such as the attack rate, which of course measures the proportion of people who became ill after exposure to the suspected source, in this case, consuming food from the Jamboree restaurant. A significant higher attack rate among patrons who consume a specific food or item during the specific time period would suggest an association between that particular exposure and the occurrence of food poisoning. You could also look at relative risk, which uh, measures the likelihood of developing the illness in the exposed group or those persons who consumed food from the restaurant compared to the unexposed group, those persons who did not consume food from the restaurant. A relative risk that is greater than one indicates a higher risk among the exposed group suggesting a positive association between consuming food from the restaurant and the occurrence of food poisoning. These are done to, of course, formulate conclusions, provide guidelines for control and preventative measures, control uh, treatment, health education, possibly stop the sale of harmful food, stop contaminated water supply, and decide on preventative measures such as vaccines when applicable. Now, in terms of the format of your report writing, of course, you want to do an executive summary giving an overview of what the epidemic is and all the major areas that you are looking at with regards to that specific report. And you have some guidance here in terms of the major section that you would include in that report. You want to, of course, characterize the place or the population, the time, and look at the disease of interest. You want to discuss here as well the possible reason for your findings. Explain, of course, what you are looking at or the outcomes that you are seeing here, and use literature to support whatever conclusions you would have drawn from or recommendations that you would be making from the study that you conducted or the investigation that you conducted pertaining to the specific epidemic. The goal in implementing preventative and control measure is to reduce the epidemic. Example, to bring it to say half or eliminate cause and to write a report for evaluation and of course create a source of reference. 
Investigating epidemic involves systematic analysis of cases, identifying sources, mode of transmission, and risk factors. Epidemiological studies, case interviews, contact tracing, laboratory analyses are key methods used to understand the outbreak's origin, contributing factors, and effective control measures. Prevention involves implementing proactive measures such as vaccination, hygiene practices, and health education to reduce the risk of disease spread. Controlling epidemics focus on timely intervention, contact tracing, quarantine, and treatment to limit the outbreak's impact and prevent future transmission. Forecasting utilizes statistical models and data analysis to predict the future course of an epidemic, aiding public health authorities in preparing resources and implementing strategies effectively. Advanced modeling techniques help anticipate disease trend, enabling timely responses and allocate resources. And so epidemic management involves coordinated efforts to mitigate the impact of an outbreak, encompassing strategies such as resource allocation, healthcare infrastructure reinforcement, public health intervention, and communication to minimize the spread of the disease and provide optimal care to the affected individuals. So again, overall aim of investigating epidemic is to manage it and prevent recurrence of the disease. It's not necessary to follow all 10 steps in chronologic, chronological order, as several tasks can be carried out simultaneously, saving time. It may be necessary to execute prevention and control measures for known disease prior to epidemic investigation. There is an epidemic, uh, there has to be a team approach so you might want to think about a team leader, public relations officer, someone, of course, who is designed to speak to the public or the media. Identify resources. So who will perform what task during that epidemic investigation? And then in terms of that team makeup, so who are the persons who are going to be making up that team? So a pharmacist, a doctor, nurse, you have your uh, lab staff. You also have your public health personnel or epidemiologist, and then your other ancillary staff who will form that team. Now, here you have a task. You can respond to this task using the contact form on the website, or you could respond to this task via email. You have, or say you have an outbreak of cholera in your district, you are the district health officer. Discuss how you would investigate this outbreak of cholera. Also, comment on the obstacles that might limit the usefulness of the revised international health regulations. And this you can get some guidance from the World Health Organization's website in terms of the framework of the IHR. <laughs> These are the references. Thank you for your attention.